Assalamu alaikum. I hope you all are doing fine. I am Amjeen Ahmed, your course instructor, and today is our second e-lecture of the course Intro to English Literature. So in the previous lecture, we discussed uh, dramatic monologue and its important features and key examples of dramatic monologue. And today we'll be dealing in detail one of the specimens of dramatic monologue that is a very famous poem by Robert Browning entitled as My Last Duchess. Now before starting with My Last Duchess or the poem itself, let's uh, discuss a few important characteristics of Robert Browning as a poet. The very first thing is he belonged to the Victorian era. He was a Victorian poet. Now, what do we mean by the term Victorian? Victorian is basically a term which is used for an era, an age in England. And it was, it comprised over almost 19th century. Almost all of the 19th century. And why do we call it Victorian era or Victorian age? Because in Britain, uh, in 19th century, uh, it was the reign of Queen Victoria. That is why it is called Victorian era. Victorian era is characterized by a lot of social and political upheavals and agitation. So, for now, we won't be going in detail that what kind of period it was. Uh, but what you need to know that actually at that period of time, there were a lot of struggle uh, going on to... Uh, implement certain social orders and certain legislative reforms now when we come to robert browning he is one of the important writer important poet of that age but when we analyze his poetry that uh, we and uh, when we analyze his poetry we see that his poetry is uh, basically aloof from the turmoil of the age it means that the characteristic of age or the upheaval of the 19th century, the socio-political conditions or the issues which were uh, actually being considered by number of other, uh, which were which were troubling number of other poets. All those issues, whether social, political or psychological, these issues have no room in Robert Browning's poetry. His poetry is quite detached aloof from the uh, very period now one of the very characteristic of that age was doubt it is said that the victorian age is actually the age of doubt now why do we say it we say it because it uh, there were a lot of scientific uh, inventions and uh, there were uh, industrial revolution was there and there were a lot of uh, transformation was occurring it was a period of transition for this. So, in that kind of period, the main pillars of faith and among all those main pillars, the most important one was actually the, uh, you can say, religion or faith itself. So, religion was being questioned. The faith on God, on the faith in God was being questioned at that period of time. And this very characteristics or this very spirit of doubt we find in uh, one of the representative uh, poet of uh, Victorian era and his name is Tennyson. So when we analyze Robert Browning's poetry, we see that he was not ravaged by or he was not troubled by any sort of uh, shaking faith or any sort of doubt which was devouring his uh, his ideas or his poetry or his personality. He was very much firm in his faith on God and he had a strong faith in God and immortality. Coming to his uh, themes or uh, in his poetry, his poetry is very much in uh, you can say dominated by the philosophical strain rather than the melodious strain in his poetry we usually have less lesser element of melody and music and a stronger element of and a stronger element of 
philosophical or intellectual stream but his poetry in contrast to tennyson is very much optimistic what do i mean by optimistic by optimistic um, i mean to say that he always sees the br- uh, brighter sides of the thing and he has a kind of unwavering faith in god in christianity in immortality and he was very much optimistic one of the very uh, characteristic of robert browning is his mastery in writing dramatic monologues and what are dramatic monologues uh, we have already discussed in the previous lecture so coming to uh, the poem itself my last uh, duchess there is a particular historical context behind this uh, poem the setting of this poem is italy during the renaissance renaissance is actually the period of 15 and 16th century and italy was the hub of renaissance rather the birthplace of renaissance uh shortly speaking renaissance is the period of you can say bloom in learning in culture in art all form of you can say all discipline of knowledge were being uh, cultured and were being bloomed by different writers different philosophers and even different scientists so this was a kind of very rich era in european history rich culturally rich uh, you can say from the point of knowledge uh, from the point of explorations and from the point of advancement coming to the speaker and the listener as we have already discussed that within a dramatic monologue there is a speaker and there might be some listener there is a single speaker so here the speaker is duke of ferrara now how do we get a kind of clue that uh, why the speaker is duke of ferrara because uh, the poem is poem ends in an epitaph okay uh now the word epitaph what is epitaph what you have to do you have to search it by yourself okay this is one of your task you will be answering me that what is epitaph now duke of ferrara is actually the speaker uh, and ferrara is actually a place in italy okay a region in italy and that person who is the speaker his name is alfonso to dieste theek hai Alfonso to DST and who is the listener listener is Nicolas Mardus Nicolas Mardus was basically an ambassador of count of Tyrol Tyrol is again a place in roman uh, in uh, holy roman empire and his name was Ferdinand II now you must know that listener is not Ferdinand II rather the ambassador of Ferdinand II whose name was nicolas mardos now actually the alfonso 2 is talking to ferdinand uh, is talking to nicolas mardos why uh, what what is the subject of who you can say the speech or uh, the purpose of their meeting or talking is basically alfonso is trying to get married to the daughter of the roman emperor and the name of that daughter is was barbara okay barbara was the daughter of roman emperor ferdinand 1 and who was arranging the marriage it was the uh, brother it was the brother of barbara who was trying to arrange the marriage and that is why he sent his ambassador nicolas to the alfonso now the subject matter or the you can say the topic of whole this speech is the duchess the last duchess whose last duchess the last duchess of alfonso or the duke of ferrara actually the last duchess was the last wife of duke of ferrara and we will see that what happened to her within the poem and her name was lucrezia di cosimi de medici i don't know how we'll be pronouncing all these uh, names because these are italian name so i'm just going uh, by the 
you can say spellings a kind of uh, I, i'm just creating a kind of relationship between the spelling and the phonetic or uh, the phones of the words so you uh, you are free to pronounce them or you may even uh, go through the dictionary some kind of some kind of audio dictionaries which could uh, like guide you how do we pronounce these words so the name of the duchess was lucrezia uh, uh, or lucrezia de cosimo de medici the 14 she was 14 year old daughter of cosimo de medici and his her father was duke of tuscany okay and his father was also the uh, duke of eleonora di toledo these are the places in also, um, also in italy now here you can see that medici is a very important family in italy and they were also uh, they belong to aristocracy but they were not as grand and as aristocratic cratic as the estever okay as the family of uh, alfonso was alfonso alfonso's family was much superior to medici family so this was a kind of you can say uh, a marriage which happened in 1558 between alfonso and uh, lucrezia but this was a mismatch marriage not mismatch i would say mismatch to nahi thi but alfonso was in the uh, was under the impression that he belonged to a better family while uh, the duchess did not belong to that much prestigious family another problem was between their marriage uh, or the conflict between their marriage was the dowry though uh, uh, though the lucrezia or the last duchess was also rich and he she brought uh, a lot of dowry with her but alfonso was not satisfied he wanted to have more dowry and he believed that if he would have married uh, in a kind of a bit more prestigious family he would have got more dowry now they married in 1558 when duchess was 14 year old and alfonso was 25 year old and after 2 months alfonso left her and within 2 uh, uh, years maybe uh, for for about 2 years he left her and after 3 years in 1561 the duchess died it is said that she died of tuberculosis but the circumstances was quite suspicious and the rivals of alfonso they propagated uh, they they uh, uh, like propagated the idea that actually alfonso poisoned the last uh, duchess or uh, his last wife so this is the whole historical context between uh, behind the my last duchess and last duchess is actually is a story or you can say uh, the incident of marriage between uh, alfonso and madu no sorry alfonso and lucrezia okay so let's start its textual analysis we'll go line by line i ex- I'll, i'll explain it line by line and we will see difficult words in it also and i'll try to explain not only the thematic content but as well as its formal content or some uh, literary devices which are used in this poem side by side now before starting the text let me tell you that i am having some hearing issues so you have to cope with me if there are certain pauses within my lecture as you have already experienced so i am having difficulty in breathing and speaking so hope you will be understanding that let's start our text i am reading the text that is my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive now here the person is speaking and he is talking about some painting which is on the wall and this painting is of duchess whose duchess 
the speaker's touches okay there is a speaker who is pointing uh, towards a painting or a portrait of uh, her uh, of his duchess so it means that he is a duke okay duke kehte hain beta nawab logon ko jinke under kuch area hota that is my last duchess painting on the wall painted on the wall looking as if she were alive and he is actually praising the portrait and he is saying that this portrait is so wonderfully made that she seems that as if she is as if she were alive because her expressions her emotions are so much lively on her face that it seems that as if this is not a portrait rather she is a real lady i call that piece a wonder now and because of this very much liveliness in this portrait i call that i who is i here the duke okay i call that piece of wonder this is a wonderful piece of uh, you can say painting fra pandolf's hand worked busily a day now who is fra pandolf fra pandolf must be uh, a painter but it is a fictional character which have been weaved uh, which has been be weaved uh, by the robert browning now fra pandolf though he has used a specific name for a character but uh, through the history we do not get any kind of clue that who fra pandolf was and there is no name of such painter in italian history so we could uh, easily say that fra pandolf is actually a fictional painter so here is saying that the painter whose name was fra pandolf he worked very busily he worked whole day and within one day he made this marvelous piece of painting and there she stand and this was the result this very portrait was the result will it please you to sit and look at her now if you see this line will you uh, will it please you now he is using a pronoun second person pronoun it means that some listener is present but we not uh, we do not know till now that who the listener is so he is actually bragging about a painting and that painting is his last duchess painting and he is very much praising his liveliness his sorry uh, her liveliness and uh the you can say the life within that portrait and he is very much proud of uh, the work of fra pandolf and he is inviting that listener that you should come and you should sit calmly and you should look at her her hair means the painting of duchess i said fra pandolf by design i have deliberately mentioned the word of fra pandolf okay now fra pandolf must be uh, here it seems that he must be very important or very, must be very expensive or aristocratic sort of uh, uh, you can say painter and that is why he is uh, mentioning his name uh, deliberately now you see whenever you uh, wear a kind of uh, uh, clothes which are from very high brand so you would deliberately mention that see i am wearing this brand of clothes so actually he is also bragging about that painting he is uh, actually asserting to the listener that see i hired that painter and he made this uh, very very precious portrait for never had a strangers like you that picture countenance countenance means face okay so here he is saying that i have deliberately mentioned the name of fra pandolf because it is not likely or it is not common for strangers like you that they would see a picture or they would see a countenance a face pictured by fra pandolf okay because uh, uh, this is not very common phenomena for never read strangers like you that picture countenance the depth and the passion of its earnest glance now he is talking about the portrait and he is talking about the you can say gaze or the passion or the 
feeling and the you can say dedication or the purest uh, pure you can say purity of passion within the glance of that portrait or the lady which is present in the portrait so he is saying that not all the people are so lucky or not all the strangers like you usually get a chance to see such portraits like uh, this of my duchess whose eyes are so full of life so full of passionate intensity so full of depth of feeling and her glance and her you can say eyes and her gaze are actually showing you all her passion and all her feelings but to myself they don't he is saying that whenever such a stranger like you they see uh, these kind of uh, picture or this picture this is specific picture they always turn to me okay now there are and there is again one line which is written in bracket since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i here we can see that this that this very portrait is not open for everyone to look upon why because this man this duke has drawn certain curtain in front of it and only he uh, could uh, you can say uh, remove the curtain so that somebody could see the portrait so let's again come to uh, the uh, idea which he was talking before the bracket sentences he was saying that whenever some strangers like you they see such uh, they see the portrait of my uh, duchess and they see the purest glance or purest gaze of my duchess they would always turn to me they always turn to me and it seems that they 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 are, they, they are actually trying to ask something and they wanted to ask something so badly so they would turn back and they wanted to ask if they durst if they durst mate if they dared they would ask how such a glance can be how could such a lively glance could be there within a portrait so not the first are you turn and ask thus so he is saying that you are also doing the same and you are not the first one to turn and ask the same question sir it was not her presence husband presence only call that spot of joy into the duchess cheek so he is saying that actually the happiness the joy the passion the feeling the intensity of emotion which you are actually experiencing in the eyes of my duchess is not something which is uh, you can say particular to my presence now you see whenever husband is there within the presence of her wife whenever a wife sees her husband she is very much happy with the joy and that joy is lurks uh, within her eyes okay so he is saying that this very but this particular look of joy or this particular tinge of gaiety is not only because of my presence because i am her husband and that is why she is very much happy though she feels uh, she used to feel happy whenever i uh, uh, used to be with uh, her but it was not only me who brought her happiness it was not only me who brought a kind of uh you can say redness on her cheeks perhaps for a pen dollar for a pen dollar chance to say her mental lapse over my lady's wrist too much he is now speculating that why such blush such pinkness is there on the cheeks of the uh, duchess because uh, he is speculating or guessing that there might have been some kind of remark which farah pandolf while painting her duchess must uh, while painting that duchess must uh, have said for example what kind of remark maybe farah pandolf has said her mental lapse mental kise kehte hain beta mental is a kind of uh, you can say cloak a kind of cloth without any sleep very elongated one so he is saying that the duke is saying that uh, 
Farah Pendolf might have said that your cloak is actually hiding your wrist too much uh, and in this way your beauty is being hidden. So that is why she 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 might have uh, uh, you can say might have felt shy and might have brought in this very comment of Farah Pendolf might have brought the uh, flush on her cheeks. Next he is saying that or perhaps paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Or Farah Pandolf, because Duchess was very beautiful, so Farah Pandolf might have said something flirty to her. And what kind of flirty remark could be? He might have said that actually your flush is so beautiful. Your, the flush or the pinkish cheeks or the you can say the pink tinge on the cheek of the duchess was so beautiful that no paint could not reproduce it no can uh, no paint could not paint it because it was so alive and painting is something which could not reproduce the real beauty of uh, the duchess so the this very flirty remark uh, might have caused this half flush that dies along her throat it means that it is coming down through her neck this flush or this pink tinge such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up the spot of joy now the duke is saying that my duchess used to think that such stuff was courtesy what is such stuff here like uh, responding to the flirty remarks or trying to be thankful or trying to be you can say responsive towards the uh, trivial people trivial people like uh, painters and servants and the other people office uh, you can say office people or the court people you, uh, the people around you who are actually there to serve you and when they give you a kind of uh, encouraging remark or uh, they praise you with some kind of uh, flirty remark so what her duchess used to think she used to think that it is it it was courteous to give response for example if someone uh, say that you are looking beautiful what would you say you would say thank or you would blush or whatever in whatever kind uh, uh, you would give a kind of response but if you belong to aristocracy or if you belong to a very high or prestigious family then you might think that it is against my dignity or it is below my dignity to give response to such meek or such weak or such you can say below rank people and same was the case with duke though duchess believed that this giving responses uh, to the peoples was courtesy or politeness okay and cause enough for calling up the spot of joy and this very little little things or these very trivial sort of things pleased her a lot and she became very much happy and this is spot of joy this is spot of joy means the blush on the cheek it was brought up over there just from these trivial things so okay it's uh, almost 27 uh, minutes so let's end it here and uh, we'll continue from line number 22 tomorrow inshallah till then you go through the whole lecture and try to understand what we have just discussed so inshallah we'll be meeting tomorrow Allah Hafiz take care